7 and verse 7. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7. Jesus began the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. And I just want to kind of go back and look at some of the themes that he's had in this, this one message. And it kind of makes sense of why we're going to be where we're at today in Matthew 7, 7. So he started back in Matthew 5 with the Beatitudes and, and talking about all the blessings uh, with the challenges that we may face in life right now. And then he challenged us that as believers we're to be salt and light. And then he started to address personal issues of um, being angry. Uh, being angry with others and how we're not to be angry people. How that's a heart issue. He encouraged us to be reconciled with our brother. Then he talked about what we look at with our eyes and, and how we can struggle with lust and how he equated that with adultery. And so there's just one challenge after another. He talked to us about marriage and he talked about going the second mile. How we're to put forth that extra effort. Do more than what is required of us. And then he told us that we're to love our enemies and do good to those that hate us. This is just one, one difficulty after another. One challenge after another to be more like him. And, and to challenge us in our relationship with other people. And then in chapter 6 he gets very personal about our motives. Even behind the good things that we do. He talked to us about doing good to please God. Not to be seen by other people. He talked to us about praying. And not to do that for show. But to have it be a part of our sincere fellowship with Him. He talked to us about fasting. And about laying our treasures up in heaven. He told us that we can't serve God and material things at the same time. That we have to make a choice. He told us not to worry, but to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and that He would provide us with everything that we need. Then last week, He told us not to be judgmental, not to have a critical spirit. And so, I don't know if reviewing this helps you think about all these things, but if you heard all that in one message, you'd probably be feeling pretty beat down. Pretty, pretty much like, God, how is anybody going to be able to do all this? How am I supposed to be able to even remember this many challenges in one message? So, he has an answer for that too. And it's about the necessity of prayer in our relationship with God. That if we are going to fulfill all of these challenges, if we're going to be able to meet... Uh, God's expectations of us, it's only going to happen when we rely on Him. And so in Matthew 7, verse 7, Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law of God. And the prophets. And so when, when we see that in verse 7. The ask. The seek. And the knock. Those are sort of progressively more intense forms of praying. When we, when we ask God. We're, we're in conversation with God. We're communicating with God. Lord I need your help. Lord uh, this is on my heart. I'm falling short in this area. I... I need my heart to change towards this person. When we're asking God for help, that's sort of what we might just call uh, normal prayer, where we're just talking to Him, mentioning it. 
But then when he gets to seeking, that's a little bit of a different level. That's when we're saying, God, I need help with this, but what's my role in this? What do you want me to do? What can I do, Lord? I desperately want you to answer me on this. What is my responsibility? An example might be, if I don't have a job, and I need a job, I need to pray about it, but I also need to look for a job, right? I need to rely on God, but that's something that I can do. I can fill out an application. I can submit an application. I can look on the online and in the newspaper or wherever. I can ask friends, hey, if you hear of anything, let me know. I need a job. And so, Lord, I'm relying on you for that job, but also recognize that I have to fill out an application and ask for one. So there's, there's that seeking level with our prayers, whatever that, that might be. And then he talks about knocking. That's a persistency. Sometimes we lose heart when some time goes by and these things that we've been praying about, we can't check them off our list. Some people actually keep track of their prayers. And then when they're answered, you know, they might put a date on it or, or check it off. But what about these things that don't seem to be answered, at least not the way we would want or in the time that we want? What if you're praying for the salvation of somebody that, that you love and years go by and you haven't seen any change? This is that, that persistence of, Lord, I'm, I'm not giving up. God, I trust in you. Lord, I love you. I'm going to keep asking. I'm going to keep talking to you about that. It could be a marital problem. It could be a, a health problem. Something that's just not, oh, I prayed about that and then five minutes later it was, it was solved. These are those ongoing things. And that shows our faith. Just prayer alone shows our faith. Why would we pray to God unless we believed in Him? Unless we believe that He's listening that he loves us, that he cares about us. But then when we're persistent in it, it shows our, our love and our care for him. And it also takes faith when God says no. When our prayers aren't answered the way that we ask them. You know, we, we may pray that somebody that we love uh, gets healed and then they die. Well, what we asked for didn't happen, but God did answer our prayer in His way. And even when it's not what we would have chosen, it shows great faith to accept that and say, God, you are God and I am not. And I'm going to trust you, Lord. I trust that you know what's best. And that is so hard for us to do sometimes. But He doesn't lack the ability to answer our prayers. When we think about that, there are limited things that, a lot, that people can do. Even people that we consider to be powerful or to have resources. God is unlimited in power. He's unlimited in resources. So when we do pray to Him, we know He can do whatever He wants. I, God, you can miraculously intervene in this situation and completely turn it around. Or he could choose not to. He's not just simply there for us to ask of things. Back earlier in, in the sermon, in chapter 6, uh, verses 5 to 15, there's a section in my Bible entitled, The Model Prayer. It's where we have what people often refer to as the Lord's Prayer, where he teaches us how to pray. And, and it wasn't just about us asking for stuff. Like he's some sort of Santa Claus, uh, give me stuff. You know, it's about having a personal relationship with him. It's about acknowledging that he is God. About talking about our spiritual life. Lord, help me forgive others as you have forgiven me. Um, it's about our relationship with him and with others. And so it reminds us that prayer is not just a time for us to be selfish and give him our shopping list. Uh, James addresses that in, in chapter 4 verses 2 and 3. James says, 
you lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. So we have in there that accountability that God not only hears what we're praying, but he knows what our motive is behind it. He knows what we would do with the things that he gives us if he decides to give them to us. Sometimes he still gives them to us and lets us make choices that we have to make. So we have that in prayer, that asking, that, that seeking, that knocking. And it just reminds us that all of these challenges that God issues in his word, he doesn't just leave us up to our own strength and our own resources to make it all happen. He's saying, you know, that he is there for us. But we have to first realize what he expects and then realize that he's the only one with the strength and power to enable us to do those things. It's, it's his strength that will give us the ability to make the right choices, to please him instead of others, to not be distracted by negativity and to really just have a pure motive of worship in our life. That he is the one that can change our heart in our relationship with other people. That he's the one that can change our motives even our, in our relationship with him by asking, seeking, and knocking and so that takes discernment where we pray God what is my part in this prayer request what can I do what do you want me to do because there are certain things where it doesn't seem like we can do anything and that's when it's just a total 100% reliance on him but then there are other things where he may say well you can do this this is what you can do why don't you do that you can pray for others. You can encourage others. That's something that almost any of us can still do with a words that we speak or a written card or whatever it might be. He goes on and contrasts himself with us in verse 9. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? So his son asks him for bread. He's obviously hungry and needs nourishment. A stone could actually resemble bread, couldn't it, in appearance? But you're probably going to recognize on that first bite that it's not bread. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. And so he's not going to give him a look-alike. He's not going to give him something that would harm our own child. And then in verse 11... He says, if you then being evil, well, that's kind of hurtful, isn't it? As he's preaching to them, if you being evil, that wasn't very sensitive of him to say that. He's saying that we're sinners. Every single one of us is a sinner. And Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Jesus Christ is the only one that can forgive us our, of our sins. And we all know what we're capable of at our worst moments. When we have been the farthest away from God, we know how terrible we can be. And God's saying to us, with all of the bad things that you've done, with all of the sinful things that we have accomplished in our lives, we would never do something like that to our children. Even us, as sinners, would still provide our children with good things, wouldn't we? And so he's contrasting us with him. He's saying, even you, being evil, would never give your hungry child a stone instead of a piece of bread. You would never give them a serpent instead of a fish. How ridiculous would that be? So he's saying that, hey, if we struggle with sin, but we still know to provide good for our kids, how much more confidence can we have in Him? He's pure. He's holy. 
He's without sin. And one of the struggles as a parent is that while I'm called by God to provide for my family, that doesn't mean that I can give them everything that I would like to. There are things that in my heart, sure, I would love to provide this or provide that, but there's this limiting factor called dollars that sometimes prohibits you from being able to do all that you want. He doesn't have that limitation. He doesn't have to check the budget. He doesn't have to see if what he's got in his checking account. He's God. So he's pure. He's holy. He's all good and has unlimited resources at the same time. So how should that encourage us to ask, to seek, to knock? Why would we waste all of our energy just doing things that are acts of futility when we could go to God who already knows our need, but He desires that relationship with us. He wants us to ask Him. He wants to know that we are relying on Him and when He decides to answer our prayers according to His will, that He will get the glory. That we will know, God, this came from You. God, You provided this. And then He gets the glory. In Ephesians, uh, just thinking about God's abilities... I thought of this passage I'm going to read to you. It's from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. It says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. That pretty much says it all, doesn't it? That it's about him. That he has all of the ability. So I just want to ask you to think about something and maybe if you have a bulletin and a pen you may even want to jot, jot some things down. What is going on in your life right now that you would say, well, you know, I pray, but I really don't know if I've even asked God about that. What do you need to ask God about? What do you need to communicate with God? There may be a burden that you carry, and as you think about it, you go, I, I have not even prayed about that. I just haven't thought about it, or I have been too busy. Ask, and then as you pray to God, say, God, when I think about the seeking part, do I have a role in this to play? Do you want me to be doing something about this? What can I do other than pray about it, other than continue to talk with you about it? Is there something that I need to do? And then when it comes to things that you carry for long periods of time because you just haven't seen an answer yet, those are definitely ones that you might want to write down somewhere so that you don't forget about them, so that you don't stop praying about them, so that you don't stop asking and seeking. So those are where we're more persistent, where we, where we knock, where we continue to come to God with that same request. Lord, you know this is still on my mind. Lord, you know that I still have a heart for this issue that's unresolved or this person who doesn't know you or this unresolved conflict from the past that we need reconciled. Not to give up on those things. We also, it can really help our faith when we realize 
if I've asked for this and God is all powerful and all loving and he has unlimited resources sometimes we cannot wrap our heads around why God hasn't done it yet and that can be tough that God why would you say no I don't understand that it doesn't make sense to me or why have you not done it yet God what could you possibly be waiting on and that's where our faith can grow say God I do not understand but God I'm not you and you know so much more than me God help me through this help me not give up and just keep trusting in you then in verse 12 he changes the subject a little bit with the golden rule that we often call it Jesus says therefore Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. So when we think about the seeking and what can we do, what is our part? Well, this is sort of a general summary that covers everything. Behave like you know God would want you to. Behave like he's watching because he is. And all the things that he's mentioned in Matthew 5 and 6 about our relationship with others. And our relationship with God and that motive that's in our heart. He's saying that it's, it's summarized here. And he, when he says, for this is the law and prophets, it's like saying, hey, this summarizes the entire scripture. Treat others like you want to be treated. Don't return evil for evil, but return good. In Romans 13, 9 says, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in the saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. That's what he tells us to do. So, that brings stability when we learn how to depend on him. He's the one constant in this world. And that's why we need to go to Him. Stability will also come through a healthy commitment to live for the benefit of others. When I recognize that that's a calling, that that's a command, that I'm to treat others the way I want to be treated, it is a daily lifestyle verse that I can apply every single day. So I want to encourage you to think about those things and to think about, you know, what, what do I do on a daily basis that makes me not take all these things to the Lord? More than likely, it's going to be because we haven't carved out a time, because we feel like we're too busy. You can make use of your drive time, make use of time when you're alone, and even if you're busy, even if you say, well, I'm not alone, well, you might have to k drive to work or something like that. Or, or maybe you, you drop kids off at school, but then it's just you on the, on the way home or on the way to work or whatever it is. To carve out that time, and if you don't even have that, if you're literally around people all the time, well, then you might just need to tell them, hey, I'm going to go pray. I'll be back out when I'm finished. Don't bother me unless it's an emergency. And you might need to do that. But to think about that. God, am I, am I going to my number one source that's available to me 24-7? I never get a busy signal. I don't have to wait for somebody to reply to a text message. I don't have to set up a meeting. Jesus is waiting. And he already knows everything anyway. So you don't even have that awkwardness of bringing up a subject that's difficult to talk about. He already knows everything. And He loves you and He has unlimited resources and can answer our prayers. So how much do we, do we share with Him? Let's pray about that. And I want to encourage you during this time of invitation. Uh, you're probably not going to have long enough right now to pray all these things to the Lord. But maybe you can start making your list. 
And maybe God will reveal some things to you that you and Him need to have a good long talk about later today. But you may be here today and not know Him personally. To think, well, how, how can I talk to Him? I don't, I don't know Him. Well, we'd love to introduce Him to you. We'd love for you to begin that relationship with God today. That begins by acknowledging our sinfulness before Him. By recognizing that, that we're sinners, that we cannot save ourselves, that Jesus is the only way to heaven. That the blood that He shed on the cross is the only way for me to be forgiven of my sin. And Brother Brandon or myself would love to speak with you today about that. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we come to you right now thanking you, Lord, for your love for us, thanking you for what you have already accomplished, thanking you for wanting a personal relationship with us that's real, that involves this communication between us. You speak to us through your word. We speak to you through prayer. And you also speak to us through prayer, just in the way that you uh, answer our prayers, the way that you comfort us, the way that you reassure us, that you, that you know us, that you care about us. And so, Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for that. Lord, I pray that we would come to you more with our needs. Lord, we mentioned in the announcements today that I just learned today that this air conditioner is broke. And we just fixed three air conditioners last week. It's expensive. And God, we, I lift that to, up to you, Lord, that you would give us the financial means necessary to fix yet a fourth air conditioner in two weeks, Lord. That you would provide, that you, your abilities to provide are limitless. We had a situation last week where we had a, a bad unit that could not be repaired. It needed to be replaced, and somebody donated that unit to our church body. Lord, it's those kinds of things that you do. Lord, that are amazing, that we can't even see coming, that we don't even know. And then it, you just provide. And so, Lord, we thank you so much for your love for us. Lord, I pray for those that might be here today that don't have that relationship with you, but they want it. God, that today would be the day of their salvation. God, that today would be the day that they begin this awesome fellowship with you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us.